opening words today are adapted from the journalist and activist Michael Pollan. The gardener recognizes that they are dependent for health and survival on many other forms of life. So they are careful to take their interests into account in whatever they do. The gardener is in fact a wilderness advocate of a certain kind. It is when they respect and nurture the wilderness of their soil and plants that the garden seems to flourish the most. Wildness, the gardener has found, resides not only out there, but right here, in their soil, in their plants, even in themselves. But wildness is more than a quality of a place, and though humans can't manufacture it, they can nourish and husband it. The gardener cultivates wildness, but he does so carefully and respectfully, in full recognition of its mystery. Let us worship, cultivate, and transform together. I learned that a pillowcase makes a fine substitute pouch for an orphaned kangaroo. I'm drawn to such dramas of animal rescue. They're warm in the throat. I suffer, the critic, the critic proclaims, from an overabundance of maternal genes. Bring me your fallen fledgling, your bummer lamb. Lead the abused, the starvelings into my barn. Advise the hunted deer to leap into my corn. And had there been a wild child, filth and filthy and fierce as a ferret, he is called in one 19th century account. A wild child to love. It is safe to assume, given my fireside inked with paw prints, there would have been room. Think of the language we too, same and not same, might have constructed from sign, scratch, grimace, grunt, vowel. Laughter, our first noun, and our long verb, howl. All right, take an easy breath, and now pray. You don't have to. You can follow your breath and net out of your body, or just wait a moment, and we'll begin. Our friend, we thank you for this day. We thank you for remembering mothers, and we pray for kindness for the hearts of those who are tender on this day. We thank you for all the people present in this place, the words that bring them their joy and sorrow to this room. I pray that you'd be with them, lift them up, and give them kindness and help in each moment. We thank you for the coming week and all that will fill it. And we give thanks and say, Amen. The story I'm about to tell you goes way back. Are you ready to go way back? All right. <laughs> One of the things that's complicated about history, what is one of the things that's complicated? The winner writes the story, right? So we began today with the idea that it is when the gardener respects and nurtures the wildness of the place, the plants, and even themselves, that they're cultivating something. And we can talk about interdependent beauty, but that too has to be cultivated. The story is a combination of cultivation and wildness. You see, very often, what I told you about the winner writing the story means that when we talk about other places, they are viewed through a lens of European discovery. But things existed before they were discovered by Europeans, right? And they were autonomous unto themselves. So this story goes back to Portuguese navigator Pedro de Mascarenhas. And he named a group of islands that included Mauritius, Rodriguez, and Reunion, the Macarines, after himself. <laughs> and this happened in 1512. 
That's the way back part I was telling you about. Then in 1642, the French colonized the island with the French East India Company. They sent the ship St. Louis to Reunion or Reunion, and they called it Ile Bourbon. Sure, why not? And at the end of the 17th century, the population could be divided into white French landowners and enslaved people from Madagascar and Africa. There, on Reunion, lived a boy named Edmund Albius. Edmund lived and worked on the plantation of Beaumont. That was his name, Beaumont. And sometimes, talking about that situation doesn't allow for reminders that people who own slaves had access to the idea that humans are meant to be free. That was a really early idea, and there have been proponents for it all along. So when I tell you that Beaumont taught Edmund botany, it's not to say that there's something redemptive about that depth of suffering. Rather, we can see the suffering and humans rising up in response as a way that they cultivated their interdependence with each other and with their potential for liberation. This is the flowers part. Are you ready? Edmund was about 12 years old. Every day, his work included going to the field with Beaumont. And in the field, he would see flowers. They were, in fact, one specific flower, the vanilla orchid. Vanilla beans are the fruits of this plant, but in Reunion at that time, there were no vanilla beans. French people and Spanish explorers had brought vanilla from Mexico, but there was one thing they could not bring, and that was the tiny bumblebee. Well, I don't know if it was bumble. It was a tiny bee that would go between the flowers and pollinate them. Without the bees, you know what happened. There were no vanilla beans. Pollination is an important exploration for us today because as we experience the effect of gathering our gifts together and experience gratitude and abundance from our combined gifts, see those combined gifts? It's worth asking, what lifts your spirit in this community? How do you lift the spirits of others? That's one of the ways we cross-pollinate. The busy bee between us is our care, our connection to one another, and our willingness to try, sometimes make mistakes, and try again. These things keep us alive in spirit, fruitful, and connected. Edmund was always learning about plants for the work he did. He had learned how to make a watermelon plant have melons by combining the pollen and seed parts of the plant. So he used that knowledge on a vanilla orchid. One day, as he walked through the field with Beaumont, Edmund showed him a plant with vanilla beans on it. He told him that he had combined the pollen and seed parts of the orchid and that's how there was fruit. He cultivated and tended the plant. And at first, Beaumont didn't believe him. Sometimes, even when we are tending and cultivating connection and growth, it is hard to believe the results that happen or hard to allow them to happen. We've talked about Brene Brown before, a researcher who specifically studies how shame affects people in relationships. She defines shame as the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. How does shame, that intensely painful feeling, affect us at the level of community? This is a question to ponder and dig deeper into. We find further specific encouragement from Dr. Cornell West. 
we have to realize that there cannot be relationships unless there is commitment, unless there is loyalty, unless there is love, patience, persistence. Edmund found a way by manually lifting the parts of the flower with a blade of grass and spreading the pollen with his fingers to make pollination happen when it wouldn't have otherwise happened. The truth of this action is ingenuity and practicality. In fact, Edmund changed history. In 1841, Reunion was exporting no vanilla, although many people were growing the flowers. And seven years later, they were exporting just about 100 pounds to France. Whereas by 1858, two tons were being exported. And by 1867, 20 tons. Near the end of the century, in 1898, well, let's see, that's not it. By then, according to the writer and journalist Tim Ecott, Reunion had outstripped Mexico to become the world's largest producer of vanilla beans. It's a story of a child who used his intelligence to make an immense difference by which an entire industry could be born. But to faithfully tell the story, we have to admit that even when some people cultivate good, other people do not cultivate the truth that they know. Edmund never saw the profit from the technique he invented. He died in terrible poverty and illness because he was part of a system that didn't recognize his full humanity, labeling him as just a slave instead of a person. This is another place for us to pause and think. It is easy for us to assume that the conditions that people experience are just a part of their lives. We also need to ask the question, what part do I have in these conditions? What am I tending? What am I creating? Every time you take part in building community, you take part in creating conditions of love, of justice, of support. In this community, we give support and take support because we are all connected. If people can only give support and no one can take support, does that sound familiar? I don't need to take support. <laughs> then we are back to practicing individualism rather than building the beloved community. Where does liberation live? In the story, not only do we see cultivation of flowers, the cultivation of vanilla beans, but we see a wide open space in which we can build a legacy of the cultivation of freedom. This is what the shared bouquet represents. Each of you free to work for justice and love in the place closest to you and some places further away. Let it be so. Let us be the ones who make it so.